the two ends, actually occurring cultural districts on one sort of end of the spectrum and then formal or top-down on the other. And this concept of naturally occurring cultural district, this was actually made, this was advanced by um, researchers Mark Stern and Susan Seifert from the University of Pennsylvania from their longitudinal research on Philadelphia. What they, what they discovered is that there are certain concentrations uh, in Philadelphia neighborhoods of arts and cultural assets. So not just nonprofit arts organizations, but also residential artists and cultural participants, members of the general public that, that frequent uh, arts and cultural offerings, and for-profit cultural businesses, as well as, there's one more, no, that is it. <laughs> So there, he dubbed these cultural clusters, and what he found is that when you have this concentration, it's actually associated with some really um, wonderful positive social and community outcomes from higher levels of civic engagement, increased population and housing values, decreased poverty rates, and all with little evidence of ethnic displacement. So partly because of those benefits and partly as a, in reaction to what he perceived to be um, a bias in public policy towards promoting more of the formal and top-down. He advocated that policy should be instead arranged to support existing concentrations of cultural assets. Um, so on the other side of the spectrum, we have more of the formal top-down. And, and you know, you could think about this as, majored by as anchored by major arts institutions. I guess the iconic example would be the first iteration of Lincoln Center. So um, now that was brought about by an urban renewal slum clearance program. They actually uh, wiped out the neighborhood that, at which West Side Story was based to build you know, those, those um, high art institutions. And it's more of a closed campus than you can think of with the, the natural occurring cultural districts. However, I do want to point out that this, this presents a dichotomy that's sometimes false. Um, in the natural occurring cultural districts, the word natural, you think that it's just totally organic, you know, that, that it just happens. But this is not really true. There are lots of people working really hard to, together and independently to create and to support this activity in the natural cultural district. And some, of, some natural cultural districts are actually formally recognized and have policy support. For example, this is the Station North Arts and Entertainment <coughs> District in Baltimore, Maryland. And it's one of Mark's, Mark and Susan's uh, case study examples. But um, so even though you know it's more production oriented, these are artists live workspaces, um, not you know, huge arts institutions. So therefore, it's a natural cultural district. District. It is um, officially a state designated arts and entertainment district, which means that they have access to some public policy support. Um, historic preservation tax credits, exemptions from arts and entertainment income, uh, arts and en entertainment taxes for events. So, and they have a management entity. So natural, but not organic. Does that make sense? Um, the takeaway here is that there is a lot of variation. This is a, a spectrum. So we've got large institutions and small <coughs> institutions. We've got how these arts districts are physically structured. Sometimes they're a linear corridor, like Philadelphia's Avenue of the Arts or the Hennepin Arts, the Hennepin Cultural District in Minneapolis. Sometimes they're scattered all over a downtown. Sometimes they're tightly clustered in a campus. Um, the type of activity is it consumption oriented, whether that's high art or more popular entertainment. Is it about production? You know, an artist live work enclave or creating hubs for cultural industry startups.